notched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tech. Here's Steve Dace. Hold on, we gotta do that again. I turned, turned your microphone off because you were clearing your throat. It's really your fault. I just want you to know that. Most things are. I know it's my fault. Uh, let's just t- take it from the top there. Okay. Going back to you. Three, two, one. Greetings. Welcome to the season finale of Bigger Ten. I'm Steve Dace with my co-host, Never Partner, the one and only Aaron McIntyre. And Aaron, I don't want to give you more work, brother, but do you realize... When we come back for our season premiere later this summer, we're gonna need we're gonna need some new imaging because the bigger ten is getting to be an even bigger ten, brother. How are you? I was hoping you would not bring that up because I feel <laughs> like I procrastinated for a final exam for about a year because we've known about this for about right. a year, right? And I was just praying, please don't remind me of this. And um, that's the first words out of your mouth. I mean, just. Yeah, you know me. You I, have like a way. I like to ease it. I like to ease things in. You yes. just have a way about you, there, Steve. Thank you for that so much. <laughs> what in the world am I? I'm going to Google basics of designing graphics that incorporates 18 different brands. Indeed. Without ripping them off overtly into a web video series. How many results do you think that'll prop, prop up on Google? Steve? Not many. I I, th- I want to say one of our viewers actually gave us a they mock-up. Did. Yeah, <laughs> that might I'm, help us. I'm right? po-boying this quite a little bit. It's yeah. just the intro. I'm probably going to try to simplify the intro. The intro that I tried to do before, uh, I tried to incorporate, you know, kind of the well-loved brands and maybe a few moments that uh, people would maybe recognize from over the years from a a number of Big Ten programs. No, there's no way I can be fair to everybody. No. No. So it's just going to be a pretty simplified intro. I don't know. Hey, now that we've got this, crowdsource, what would you like to see from an intro? Let us know in the comments, which I may or may not read. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> What would you like to see from a very simplified intro uh, perspective? That's what I want to know. You know, the, the Big Ten Network's already planning. It's uh, out at USC Heisman Trophy uh, special, yeah. honoring all the Big Ten Heisman serious? Trophy winners from USC. The Michigan-Washington All-Big Ten yeah. National Championship game last yeah. year, right? You know you know that this is coming, man. Yeah. 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 The question is, will the Big Ten culturally appropriate O.J. Simpson into its, its history with the addition of USC? But that's oh, a topic yeah. for another day. Mm-hmm. Indeed. All right, so it's our season finale, and here's what we're going to cover this week. We do this kind of every year for our season finale. Uh, we go through, I at least I do, I get a chance to watch as many Big Ten football spring games as I can. This year I had a chance to watch nine of the 18 teams. Um, I wasn't able to see any of the West Coast teams. I didn't have access to any of their spring games. But uh, we go through and fire off some conclusions about the teams we had to see And frankly, a lot of times these are pretty accurate. I'm a big believer that what you see in the spring is the template for your team. That teams are really forged in the spring. And then once we get to the fall, that's really about preparing for the upcoming season. So the identity of a team now, now this era now with the transfer portal and everything else, you can improve and get better for sure. But the overall template of your team, the internal culture, uh, leadership, a lot of that gets forged in the spring. So, Aaron, we're going to split this up. We're going to do uh, the first half here in the first segment, and then after the break, we'll do the second half. So I think it's only appropriate we start with the reigning champions, uh, the Michigan Wolverines. Um, Watching their spring game, uh, they're going to have more talent and depth than I think many people expect, especially on defense. There there are – I mean, I think there's another maybe 10 guys on this team that will get drafted next year uh, in the draft, including – maybe three or four picked in the first round. The question, though, is, you know, um, they look championship caliber everywhere except the most important position on the field at quarterback. Now, we know that 
even when you've got a first round pick at quarterback, Michigan will not play an offensive scheme that relies that that's quarterback reliant. But you still need a guy that can make a key throw here or there. And you still need at least a Cade McNamara type. And what I saw there in the spring, I'm I'm not sure that they have that player yet. And the closest thing to that is a walk-on who's been in the program for four years and hasn't played a single meaningful snap of football in a Michigan uniform. So if if as a Michigan fan, if I thought, you know, with the guys we lost to the draft and losing Jimmy, we were probably a eight and four team, I'd just say play Alex Orgy and let him grow with the roster. But because this is a team that I think is capable of winning the Big Ten for a fourth year in a row, I, I think now the what you need out of a quarterback is is a little bit more than what Penn State suffered last year. Remember all last summer I said, I'm concerned about Penn State. They have that roster that's ready to win this year but they didn't get Drew Aller ready at all the year before. He didn't really play any meaningful football after the Purdue game. And you saw last year, he kind of had to grow up and the team suffered as a result. I could see Michigan suffering that kind of fate based on what I saw in the spring. Yeah, don't you think Michigan seems like the type of team that, you know, they could have a pretty solid but not flashy season, kind of like last year. Um, Flashy meaning I'm not putting up 60 points every single game, week in and week out. It's a solid season. You might be 10 and 1, 11 and 0 heading into the Ohio State game. People just maybe say, hey, this is an Ohio State renaissance. Again, we're talking about hypotheticals here in just the first day of May. Ohio State looks like they're having a little bit of a renaissance, you know, this year, and it's kind of a foregone conclusion that they're probably going to beat Michigan in the game this season. And Michigan goes in there solid, nothing's flashy, nothing special this year. They win one game, and all of a sudden, oh, hey, Michigan's back in the college football playoff. At at worst, or at best, if they win the game, they could have, uh, what is it, one of the four buys that mm-hmm. you have as well. So I, I think it seems weird to say, but then when you take into account what you just said, their head coach left, you know, they had all these guys drafted. Of course, it's going to be a, a popular public conclusion that there's going to be a drop-off this year, and there might be in some ways, but I don't think it's going to be, as you said, as drastic. I mean, we are talking about a national championship caliber program right now. And it's not like everybody just hit the breeze after uh, the championship game. They've still got some good pieces there. So I think Michigan is going to surprise people who are not maybe tuned into this as deeply as as some are. Um, so, yeah, I think they could go into next season and we'll have more than enough time to talk about that and really surprise a bunch of people. But that kind of confirms what I was thinking about your comments on their spring practice. Well, let's talk about the Buckeyes because there is kind of a sense, as you said, that this is their year now. Uh, They've gone all in. I mean, uh, on the Fox broadcast, Urban Meyer basically said Ohio State blew blew the bank wide open uh, for this year's roster. Last year at this time, it was anticipated Ohio State was going to have maybe eight top 100 draft picks in the NFL. They had one. Why? Because all those guys came back, and you know they didn't come back for free. So the Buckeyes are all in this year, and I got to tell you, watching their spring game, man, they looked absolutely loaded as always, but but even physically. I mean, guys like Jack Sawyer look like the incredible Hulk Lou Ferrigno from back in the day, but this is built differently than past Ryan Day iterations. It looks more like a Harbaugh-era Michigan team. Um, I, I, think it, I think Will Howard is really not much of an upgrade over Kyle McCord. I think he's more mobile. So I don't think he's as good of a thrower as Kyle McCord, but I think he's more mobile. So I, I think you've got a Jag plus who can maybe turn third and six into a first down with his legs, and maybe that helps. Um, I thought the younger quarterbacks, including the one everybody raved about, Julian Sand, did not look like they were ready at all. And I would be, I'd be really concerned about, about if I were a Bucknut. What keeps me up is. They're, they're as loaded as any team in America everywhere except the two positions that Michigan exploited last year, quarterback and offensive line. And really, offensive line's been a problem for them against Michigan the last few years. Uh, they couldn't keep Ojabo and Aiden off of C.J. Stroud last year. Um, uh, Michigan's defensive front, uh, as the game wore on, uh, took more and more control of the game in Columbus. And then last year, you know, Michigan had the best defense in college football. The Ohio State team, and it was a thud spring game, meaning that no one was taken to the ground. All right. So guys are barely even going full speed. If it was a passing down, Ohio State's quarterbacks were blue, were blown dead almost every time. I mean, the, the protection really struggled. And some of that is guys are split up. I get that. 
But but that's the one unit. If I was concerned, how do we not get John Coopered by Michigan again? Is the is they looked superior to Michigan at the, at every position I saw, except for the two that Michigan has has beaten them at the last few years. Yeah. So my rationale all last season, and you heard it a number of times on on Bigger Ten, is that your receiving core at Ohio State would cover a multitude of sins. Whether mm-hmm. that was the offensive line, whether that was maybe a, a lack of ceiling at the quarterback position that you're accustomed to at Ohio State. Well, we kind of learned that, yeah, they had success. They had uh, good success last season. But when it came to the upper echelons of the competition, namely Michigan, that was the only one that really mattered. It just couldn't hold up. When they were forced to play a way that they didn't necessarily want to play for a full game, they just could not hold up. So, yeah, that's that's obviously a cause for concern there. You just have to hope that... As you said, is there some sort of X factor at one of those positions? It's hard to have. Is there an X factor at a, at a line position on either side of the ball? At least, at least at the offensive line, is there an X factor on offensive line? X factor on defensive line, sure. You've got a great bull rush or something like that at one position or some guy that can come off the bench and do something special. But there's not really a whole lot that you can do to cover up uh, inequi- or inability at the, uh, at the offensive line spot. So you better hope that Will Howard brings something to the table this year and is allowed to do something that maybe Kyle McCord couldn't or wasn't uh, allowed to do last season. But, I, but I'll tell you, man, at all but two positions, they look like next year's senior bowl roster. I mean, th- that's a legit top two preseason team for sure. Uh, let's talk next about Purdue. I thought there was improved size and depth across the board in year two under Ryan Walters, which you'd expect. Uh, they were very active, as active as any team in the Big Ten was in the transfer portal comprehensively. The rosters in their game were evenly split. That led to a very competitive game to the end, which is what you want to see with evenly split rosters. But there's a lot of new faces to mesh there, and they're playing a really tough schedule. And so, I mean, I, I think it's possible Purdue could have three losses before we get to October. And if you're looking at bowl eligible, that can be a steep climb. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure what again. This is going to be common refrain as we enter the new bigger 10, the biggest 10, if you will. You know, I'm not really sure what what a reasonable positive expectation is for most of these teams. And that's not unique to the Big Ten. That's not unique to your fan base. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you, Steve Daces. I'm talking about you listening and watching the show. It's not unique to your fan base. It's not unique to college football right now. It really never has been. I'm just not sure, again, with the realignment, uh, what a positive, realistic expectation for most of these programs is. And Purdue is is exhibit A when it comes to that. I'm not really sure what to make. It's it's encouraging when you see good signs like this during spring ball. You don't want guys falling flat on their faces. But again, projecting what a Purdue can do in any year, five years ago or now in 2024-25 season, it's just really, really difficult to, to make of this with the ever-changing landscape. So uh, we'll, again, have more time to do this in the offseason as we, as we project more, but... Um, you know, you just don't, I guess the bottom line expectation or at least the basement expectation I have for uh, the Purdue's of the world, the Rutgers of the world, the Maryland's of the world, which we'll talk about next segment, just don't fall flat on your face during spring ball. I think that's a decent expectation to have. Let's talk next about Penn State. I wasn't really sure what to make of their spring game. Uh, they have two new celebrated coordinators there. The offensive coordinator from Kansas that has a lot of respect, Tom Allen, the former Indiana coach is coordinating the defense. So you had to know this was going to be really vanilla, man. They, they open up against West Virginia on the road, all right? So, you know, West Virginia won nine games last year, brings a lot of guys back. So you know Penn State wants to show n- nothing, given what how, how tough that opener is going to be. So this was very vanilla. Uh, the conditions were also very gusty. Winds up to 40 miles an hour. So, you know, take everything that you saw in that game with a grain of salt. Two takeaways that I think – Stuck out to me, uh, whether regardless, uh, they set their top two running backs, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. Brother, they're young running backs. Looks really good. I mean, they're they're loaded for bear for the future at that position, which also means the run blocking was pretty good too because the throwing game was not much of a threat in these conditions. Um, but I also thought in terms of size, they looked noticeably smaller. After watching Ohio State and Michigan like, I would argue Drew Aller is one of the most physically imposing players I saw on Penn State's team in that spring game. 
So uh, they they looked noticeably smaller to, than Michigan and Ohio State to me. Other than that, though, and the impressive depth at running back given the conditions and the weather, but also in the coaching staff where you've got new coordinators and you don't want to you know, show much of anything with that tough opener to start the year. Really vanilla exercise at Penn State. Yeah, I just don't have much to say about Penn State. Other than this, I just... Given what happened last season, in uh, he, you you noted their roster was ready to go. Then we expected more from Drew Aller, or at least I did, and I still can't pronounce his last name correctly. You better hope you better hope that he's your superstar. That's basically what I'm looking for in Penn State this year. Better hope that he's your superstar because I'm not sure really. I'm not really sure where you go from James Franklin. He's he's had good rosters. He's had great rosters and still has never really been able to, except for one time, completely bust through that ceiling. So I, I'm just looking for a superstar to kind of save them. They You can see what they did when they had Trace McSorley, who was a great college quarterback, but we're going now back five years ago now, four or five years ago. Uh, Trace McSorley and, and Saquon Barkley, great superstars. They need somebody like that at a program like Penn State. I'm talking about a program like Penn State is a pretty damn pro, pretty damn good program. I, I just don't know what it's going to take for James Franklin to break, break through, and I don't think we learned much. And we were, and by the way, we were right. Last year was the year for them to compete. They had ten guys picked in the NFL draft mm-hmm. too. Yeah. All right, one more team this segment. Let's talk about Illinois. Now, for whatever reason, they kept no official score. I, I have no clue what was the point of that, especially given the way the game was played. You, I think you'd want some of these stats out there. I mean, um, it was a very offensive game. The number two offense moved the ball pretty well on the first team defense. So you can spin that as a positive or negative. I mean, Illinois took a massive step back last year on defense with all the guys that they lost and the coordinator. Uh, it didn't look all that much improved to me. I thought both quarterbacks, Luke Altmeyer and Donovan Leary, both looked really good. But again, That's a double-edged sword this time of year, right? Because it's at the expense of your own team. So does that not bode well for the defense? Or did those guys execute so well, um, you know, uh, because they're that good and it's outside of that dynamic? Uh, You know, that's something you don't know until you see them play a team with a different helmet come come the fall. Yeah, again, you know, it could have been, uh, you know, nobody's hitting anything. They looked like trash. I mean... Again, you just don't, like you just said, you don't know until you see somebody uh, with a different colored jersey and, and pads on. And so I guess if their quarterbacks look good, if their offense is moving well, you just take that away from your spring game. Looks good. Okay. Don't really know much, but it didn't look terrible. It didn't look like puking all over yourself, falling flat on your face. So again, this is a number, another one of those teams that you just want them to look decent and not look uh, like a dumpster fire. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, we've got another batch of team spring games to discuss, and then a very, very early post-spring power rating of Big Ten teams 1 through 18, and I'll let Aaron react to that here in a moment. All right, back here on the season finale of Bigger Ten as we are summing up spring football across the Big Ten with the spring games I had a chance to watch. Let's next go to Michigan State. And I, I have no idea what, and in fact, I rewound the clip to make sure that it wasn't clear they were talking about some point in the future. And yes, they were talking about this season. BTN's Anthony Heron, apparently day drinking, uh, is allowed now uh, by the Big Ten Network crew before live broadcasts, uh, talking about Michigan State, um, which didn't even have a, a practice or have a game, but a practice, which is never a good sign. Remember last year in the fall? Mm-hmm. When Indiana was the yeah. was the one team that had didn't let them see practice, and we were, and we knew what that meant, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you typically do that when you're a first year coach taking over a roster, and you're in a year zero situation. You don't have the numbers to have a real game, and you don't want to show that off. Well, that's exactly what Michigan State looked like. It's not realistic that they're going to be a playoff team this season. This is this absolutely looks like a year zero roster to me, based on what I saw. It looked dramatic. It looked demonstrably behind all of the other teams that I saw, and that'll be reflected in the power ratings that we'll do. Now, I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Smith, the head coach they hired, who did a great job at Oregon State. But you know, he's a dirt road kind of a builder, and um, he's the kind of guy that's going to strip something down. They had several key defensive guys, by the way, they were counting on this year jump in the portal after spring. 
which kind of also tells you that Jonathan Smith knows I've got a guaranteed contract. I can kind of take an L this year. If you're not on board, I don't have to get to a bowl game this year and put up with your act. You know what I'm saying? That mm-hmm. I can just clean house, okay? And and it looks like he's cleaning house. That 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 does not look like a competitive roster based on what I saw at that spring practice. It wasn't even a game. Yeah, I laughed when I saw that tweet. I mean, realistic expectations. You know, it's more realistic. <laughs> It's, it's more realistic than maybe it was last season, uh, but only because there's more player, more teams making the playoff now. Uh, I don't know. I think that's one of those moments where it's like, oh, crap, the camera's on. My mic is hot. Yeah. I need to say something. And, and we've got to be positive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe we should actually blame that on the, on the play-by-play guy who asked that question as a setup. OK, yeah. maybe Anthony Heron, maybe I owe him an apology. He was put in a bad spot. And it's really the yeah, what, what play by you, play guy who asked a stupid question. Say there. You're back at you're back at Michigan State because you attended Michigan State for yeah. oh, a year, didn't you? Yeah, uh, you're, you're 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 tasked with um, you're tasked. With, you're, you're on the BTN uh, collegiate team. The play by play goes down to play by play guy goes down to Steve Dace and for some solid uh, green and white analysis. Hey, is it realistic that the uh, Spartans make the playoff this year? Steve Dace, your thoughts. What do you say? I'll tell you what is realistic is that Jonathan Smith knows how to build a football program. And if you can build a winner, a consistent winner at Oregon State, which has rarely had consistent winning programs in its history as a college football program then you can do that here, a program that has been to a college football playoff, and a Penn State hasn't, and Iowa hasn't, Wisconsin hasn't. So if you can do that at Oregon State, you can do that here. It's going to take some time, but I'd be confident, based on what he did at Oregon State, that he could eventually get there. You majored in Tecmo Bowl at Michigan State. Yes. And you did a better job than Anthony here. Yeah, thank you. So there's that. Moving on. (laughs) Let's Now, this was the spring game that blew me away. For Nebraska, it was all about celebrated quarterback recruit Dylan Rayola, the son of Dominic Rayola, uh, for a long time was considered the number one high school quarterback in the class of 2024, ended up, I think, number two in one service, number three in the other. He is this this proud program's anointed savior. He was originally committed to Georgia, decommitted, uh, and, and joined up with Matt Rule. And I have to tell you, man, it's the most impressive performance by a freshman in a Big Ten spring game I have ever seen. He absolutely looked apart. He was going against the Nebraska number one defense. And that's a good defense. That was a good defense last year. It'll be a good defense this year. Um, I mean, he looked good. I mean, he wears Pat Mahomes' number. He mimics his posture, delivery, off-platform throwing. Um, I mean, it's he's like a Pat Mahomes impersonator. Uh, he was just really impressive. I'm, I'm like, if this guy were the, was their quarterback last year, they win seven or eight games. Now, this year's schedule is harder than last year's, I think. But um, this might be the year they finally get off that schneid. They've not even been to a bowl game at Nebraska since 2016 because it wasn't just him. I, I saw several other get-off-the-bus, eye-test kind of guys. When it, you know the old when the guy gets off the bus, you're like, that guy's a player. I saw several of those guys at Nebraska. And I, I know there is this thing with Matt Rule – Kind of like you know when John Beeline was in, in the Big Ten, his first year everywhere he went, they were terrible while he was rebuilding. And then year two, they took a big leap. And that's kind of been Matt Rule's history uh, at Temple, Baylor. I could see that happening this year at Nebraska. Um, when we do the power ratings here in a few minutes, a lot of people are going to think they're very high. If, if I was just basing it off of what I saw when I watched all these teams last weekend, I would have actually put them higher. Um, but, I, but I factored in their recent history. So... Let the preseason hype commence. I, I was impressed. I was. I still got to see this, though. I don't blame you at all. I still got to see this. Yeah. Mike Riley had several really good recruits. Or recruits, I should say. He had several really good recruits. He had several decent-looking teams. Yeah. I thought on numerous occasions. Scott Frost had a top 25 recruiting class every year. The favored son with a top 25 recruiting class. This is the year. This is the year. This is the year. I really think highly now of Matt Rule. I do. I think highly of him. In hindsight, more highly of him, obviously, because he has a better record, at least at a higher level, than Riley or Scott Frost had. I still got to see this happen at Nebraska. Still got to see it happen. So, uh, I, you know, for that fan base who has been beleaguered, as you just laid out in a number of ways, 
I hope this is for them now, not as an Iowa fan, but we're done with the divisions now. Uh, you know, I hope for them that they finally have their breakthrough year. This seems like, just like it seemed like on a number of other occasions and other seasons, this seemed like the year to do it. This seems like the stars are aligning, but I just got to see it happen. Don't blame you at all. And if the roles were reversed and you had watched the game and came back with this report, yep. I would be saying exactly what you're saying. I got to yep. see this myself, okay? Um, but I did see it myself, and, and I was impressed. I'll, I'll, let me put it this way. At a minimum, Matt Rule scripted a, a a performance and a presentation to give the perception off that his program is about to take a big step. At a minimum, that's what happened. Oh, good for them. Good for All them. Right. Let's get to Maryland. Uh, the focus there, they have a three-way quarterback battle. They got holdovers and Billy Edwards and Cameron Edge. And then the NC State transfer, MJ Morris, who basically saved the Wolfpack season last year. He was redshirting to transfer. He agreed to burn that redshirt to save their season, and they ended up being a top 25 team. And watching their spring game, the conditions were not great, and he was the only one that could move the offense and was clearly the superior option that day. So everywhere else, you know, it's typical Maryland, good-looking athletes at receiver, a couple good-looking athletes on defense, but they're not going to be great there. It's really a quarterback the opposite of Michigan, what we said about them last segment, it's really a quarterback-reliant system uh, under uh, Mike Loxley. And M.J. Morris, the NC State transfer, looked like the clearly superior option to me. I've noticed that Sirius XM College uh, Sports Radio, I think it's 84 on, uh, on Sirius XM, they have a lot of promos featuring Mike's, Mike Loxley. Have you noticed that as well? I, I don't hmm. know if there's something that I'm missing there. Maybe he just makes himself available to them more often. Could be, yeah. Uh, but it, when it comes to Maryland, same thing uh, every year. Looks like they have some great pieces on offense. Probably do. Uh, it's just when are they going to be able to put both sides of the ball together? Then you never know. A team like uh, Maryland, if they have that long, you know, kind of somewhat long string of success on the offensive side of the board, you never know when – when the stars could align just right and they could really make hay while the sun shines. But again, we're, we're kind of saying the same thing every offseason with Maryland, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You want some sort of consistency there. It's not like this is all bad, uh, but it seems like this is a, just the same thing we, we talk about every time this year with Maryland. I think we've got one more, right? Indeed. All right, let's talk about Rutgers. Uh, Rutgers held out a lot of guys, which makes how competitive and well-played this game was more impressive. I mean, they played clean, they played tough, they played physical. Um, that's a testament to what, uh, how much this program has improved under Greg Schiano. Both quarterbacks, Gavin Wimsat and Minnesota transfer, uh, Kalik McManus, uh, both looked good. Or Kaliak McManus, I should say. I always put the wrong emphasis there on the, on the syllable. Uh, both looked really good, played well in the game. They both led multiple scoring drives, but it wasn't like – oh, no, the defense sucks. They're just taking up huge chunks. It was just really efficient, making plays, getting stuff done. I mean, this was honestly, again, impressive. This this looks like a team that, and, and I think what you said a few minutes ago was so key with the with the, the, more, the, the added depth coming to our league, the lack of divisional play. We, we really don't know yet. These teams outside of the real top tier, what's realistic for them now? Right. You know, yeah. for an Iowa level program and, and I didn't get to see their spring game. They, it wasn't televised for an Iowa level program. Nine and three is a great year because it usually meant when in the West, if you did that. Right. Mm -hmm. But now if you're nine and three, you're still doing that. But there's not a title at the end. What does that mean? Right. Likewise, Rutgers could be a lot better, but not get to a bowl game because of the how, how much deeper the league is. When last year it made one and then beat Miami, you know, and, and had, a, by its standards, a great year. So I, I'm hesitant to put too much on the programs outside of the teams we know are competing for playoff spots because the depth of this league and the lack of divisional play and the imbalance in the scheduling, we're not really sure what is realistic expectations now on a perennial basis for those teams outside the top tier. But Rutgers look like a, and I say small p, although they're about to be capital P, a small P professional, competent college football program to me. Yeah, this is kind of the struggle. And you heard a little bit last segment. This is kind of my struggle with some of these teams. It's like, yes, you may be getting a lot better and you may look really good in the spring, which is better than, 
Yeah, that's better than a lot of Rutgers spring games that we've been able to talk about over the years. But what does that really mean in terms of wins and losses, in terms of prestige at the end of the season? Because here's the new era of of college football that we're entering into. And I I don't want to sound whiny about this. It's kind of impossible not to. But there's really, it's going to be harder than ever before to break into the upper class. Yeah. of college football. I agree. That's just the reality. And I I don't even think once you start playing paying players, it will get a little bit better, but I really don't think that's going to change all that much once you start play, paying players, which I'm sure we'll get into in the weeks to come. But it's I, it's just because of the scheduling and because of the conferences, you're just it's going to be harder than ever. You're not going to be able to catch lightning in a bottle where you have the intersection of an experienced team that has spent a lot of time in your program, the intersection of that with a somewhat easier manageable uh, 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 schedule, that opportunity is just not there. Yeah. Right now, both of those things are gone. uh, Every single single team in the Big Ten, and you could say the same for the SEC, at that level, the same thing for the Big 12, every single team has a difficult schedule. So that's one of those intersections that's kind of gone. Right now, in the Wild West of the transfer portal, you don't have most of your roster in a lot of these places, or at least a good chunk of your roster. You got to re recruit them every single season. So, Mm -hmm. every single year, you're at risk of losing that other intersection, which is hey, you've got a lot of experienced players who have a lot of experience in your program, in your system. And so, right now, both of those, both of those roads on that intersection are just kind of gone. One of them may come back with, you know, paying players, but the other one, that's gone forever, at least as far as I can see. And so it's really going to be difficult. I don't know what success means anymore for a lot of these programs. I think that's very, very well said. So post-spring, if you put a gun to my head and I had to do it right now, here is how I would power rate the 2024 Big Ten heading into the offseason when there's still going to be transfer portal activity, summer workouts, training camp. So still a lot to unfold before the season begins on August the 24th. But I'd have... And, and let me put these in tiers, because I think that's more important than numbers. Because we have 18 teams, Aaron. Uh, you know, it, 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 is there that much of a difference between 15 and 18? Probably not. Or between 8 and 12? Probably not. So let's put them in tiers. To me, I would put Ohio State and Oregon in their own tier. I think Ohio State is as loaded as any team in the country everywhere except offensive line and quarterback. Um Oregon is not as loaded as them, but I think Oregon will unquestionably have the best quarterback in our league this year with Dylan Gabriel. And and they're good enough up front that superior quarterback play means that they're in that tier, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yep. Okay? So I would put them in a tier by themselves. I, I think they are absolutely the favorites to, to play each other in Indianapolis in December for the second time because they play each other in late October in, in or mid-October in Eugene. I would put Michigan in its own tier. Um, I, I, I think Michigan, there's, there's a quarterback difference because I, I didn't even see a Will Howard who's at least won big games at Kansas State. I didn't even see Michigan with that, and they certainly don't have a Dylan Gabriel. So I think you have to put, those, put Michigan behind those two teams. But what I saw physically Michigan will have, I think the teams that they're playing that are below them will not be able to block them like the last few years, and I think they'll be able to block them. So I would put Michigan in its own tier. And then I'd kind of say Penn State with its overall recruiting base, USC with its overall recruiting base, Iowa with the defense that it is bringing back this year. I would kind of put them in another tier. And then I'd take Nebraska, with which I think has a potential to break out of this tier and get into the next one. Washington, which lost a ton, but but still was a team that, that was playing for a national championship last year. Uh, Wisconsin, who, of course, is a solid program in the Big Ten, and and it fits a lot of the dilemma that you were just describing really applies to a team like Wisconsin and your Hawkeyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and Rutgers, Maryland, and Northwestern, I'd put them in their own tier. And, I would, and I'd venture that at least one of those teams breaks out of that tier and moves up to the next rung. And then I'd put Illinois and UCLA um, in another tier, uh, teams that I think legitimately – could uh, could go bowling, and um, it would be a disappointment if they didn't, but maybe not much more than that. And then I'd take those last four teams and put them in their own tier, and maybe one of those four can get to six and six. 
Um, but but that's how I tier it right now. And I and I I think when you're ranking 18 teams, it's probably more about what tier they're in than what number they are. Yeah, I'd say there's there's one team that really kind of jumps off the page. But then when you look at their look at their win total, which I'm looking up right now, it kind of makes sense. And that's Minnesota. Boy, that kind of surprises me. They're all the way down in the last tier there. But I believe their win total, win totals are already out for a number of teams. Let me look this up real quick here. I believe I saw Minnesota's win total this season, and we'll get into this again a lot more in the in the weeks to come. But their win total right now is five for the season. What's it juiced to, the over? 135. To the over? So it's juiced to the over, but yeah. we're talking about a borderline. But 135 is not that... You know, no. Byzantine. And we're talking yeah. about a borderline, maybe bull team. So yeah, they're basically kind of saying in line six with, and sixty forty that they'll get to a bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of in line with uh, where you've got them there, kind of a marginal team. But uh, I don't really have too many qual- uh, too too many bones to pick with this. Um, Michigan, I I believe is still the team there that a lot of people are going to sleep on. Do they have the highest ceiling or a, as high of a ceiling as they had last year? No. Of course not. No, no they don't. But, they're but I still, think the floor is a lot higher than people are thinking it is. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the key part there. And if if they get – do they play Oregon this year? They play them at home in early November. Yep. So early November in Ann Arbor. Oregon under Dan Lanning is a lot different Oregon team than what we were accustomed to. You know, they can play the kind of granted out, but yep. it's also across the country. So you get the right team at the right situation, and Michigan could still be there at the end of the season playing in the game – for, of course, a trip to the Big Ten title game on the line and maybe a buy in the playoff. It's not that far out of the realm of possibility. So not as high of a ceiling, but I still think you just can't sleep on a team that just went to the national championship game and won. And if you're Sharon Moore, that's what that's all you need in year one, right? You don't want to be 7-5 and five and playing in the Outback Bowl because that narrative is like, oh, Jim's gone, Michigan's toast, Correct. right? If you can even just get 9-3 and three and into the playoff in year one, with everybody that Michigan lost, that gives you momentum moving forward as a first-year head coach. All right, we'll come back and wrap things up here in a moment. Real quick, it just dawned on me, if you don't mind, indulge me for a second. When we started Bigger Ten, John Miller and I were debating whether or not Nebraska or Missouri or Maryland or Virginia was coming into the Big Ten, okay? Okay. We're now, you and I Oregon. just went through an exercise, yeah. Aaron, where we just rated 18 teams in this league. That just That's, dawned on me during our break. We just, we had power, eight, an 18 team power rating of the Big Ten. What a crazy era this has become, man. I just, I just wanted to make a point out of that here for just a minute. That is crazy. It, I also feel a little dirty in some ways. I, UCLA. I know. I know. I just. I know. It's gonna. It's just gonna be. I'm weird. trying to think of a good analogy for the, for what this would be like, in a in a more tangible way. Yeah. But it's like how weird a Big Ten media day is going to be when Lincoln Riley stands up to speak. Yeah. It's like going to a a high school reunion, except your high school is in a different state. Yes, that's a it's great a, analogy. Like, yeah. I, no, this is not the high school that I went to, but right. I see all my teammates here. But there's, we're in a different. This is not where I went to high school. Right, that's a great analogy. All right, I'm sorry. I just, I had a, I had a senior moment there. I had to address that. All right, let's get to this week's Twitter poll results. We asked you, what's the biggest unanswered question in the Big Ten coming out of spring football? Fifty-two percent of you said Iowa's starting quarterback, and I don't disagree because we're talking about if Michigan has a quarterback good enough. Right now, we're finding, out, we're wondering, does Iowa actually have a quarterback? Uh, yeah, between, the guy Deacon Hill taking their one reps in in the spring yeah. practice, he's not he's not there anymore. And I mean, Cade McNamara's basically played one half of football at a hundred percent in two years. Yeah. All right. So that's why there's a lot of talk about Devin Brown, the Ohio State yeah. kid, maybe transferring in. We'll I'm see. fine with a QB competition. Yep. Not, nothing against Cade McNamara. I just think no. there needs to be. I mean, the guy's been hurt a lot two years in a row. You have yeah. to have an insurance policy there, no doubt. Uh, 25% of you voted for Michigan starting quarterback. 14% of you talked about Washington's overhaul. Everybody is forgetting how many, how much talent Washington lost and a great coach. Uh, and then 8.7% of you said Drew Aller, who remains the big question for a lot of Penn State fans. That needs to be number two or number one. You think one. that should be number two? Yeah. I, I, I think you can make the case for that for sure. 
That brings us to our feedback of the week from Mr. Bucknut talking about Dylan Raiola. He says, listen, I don't think his ability was the worry for everyone. It was his commitment and wanting the attention. He played for four different high schools and committed to three different colleges. Yeah, I get that. I'd be Here's why I'm not concerned about that, because of the school he ended up at. It's daddy's alma mater. You know what I'm saying? Yes. You got to come correct. Like if he, if, if he had ended up anywhere else, then I think this becomes much more prevalent. But he ended up at daddy's alma mater. He ended up where he was running around the field in diapers, man, and underoos. And you just, you, I, you don't take that unless you're going to be committed because that's going to be what's demanded of you uh, is that you're just going to remain. I mean, Will, I look at my team. Will, Will Johnson could have had how many multi-million dollar offers on the, on the open market as a top five NFL draft pick, consensus All-American corner, how many teams right now are thinking Will Johnson's the missing piece for us winning a national championship? Here's millions of dollars. He didn't even consider it. Why? Same thing. His dad played at Michigan. He grew up here. And his dad wasn't close to the player that Dominic Rayola was for Nebraska. So I think that's kind of the mitigating factor. But I get that concern. Yeah. But I also think this story is going to be more common in the transfer portal era, too. A lot more guys that have been moving around a lot. So it, it is a red flag to me, just objectively, or trying to see this ob- as objectively as possible. Do we know, is there any, like, did you ever watch the show QB1 on Netflix? I've seen a little bit of it before. Not so this is the one that um, the draft Knicks were citing as the reason why Spencer Rattler, that's not the only reason, but one of the reasons yeah, why Spencer... did he basically Spencer bully Lutton, a kid on the show? He bullied a kid. Yeah. He, he led his team on about why he was missing a game when it was really because he was, I think he was smoking pot or something like that. Oh, boy. It was just... It, it, I came away watching that show. I had to turn it off after. In other words, you're explaining why episodes. Spencer Rattler was a fifth round draft pick. I've, yeah, gotcha. yeah, I, okay. I yeah. hate that guy. And yeah, I know he's 17 years old. I hate that guy. I, I really dislike the people around him too, who are who are leading him on. That's that's the thing with Dylan. Uh, sorry, Riola. What's his name? Yeah, Riola. You're right. Riola. Yep. You know, if it was something like that, that would be a major red flag. The commitments to a bunch of different schools. That is a red flag. But if there are character concerns, like was obvious with Spencer Rattler, that would be where I'd really, you know, it seems like the ability and talent is there. Obviously, a bunch of d- different schools want him. Yep. Uh, but if it was a character concern, that's in a, uh, to me, that's a categorical difference. Like, let's, let's say Dylan Rayola Ray ends up at a, at a program currently of Nebraska's stature that, he, that his dad did not play at. I think this becomes much more relevant. He took a bag to show up there. He's going to have one great year, and then dude's parlaying yeah. that into getting more money from Georgia than they offered him the first time. You yeah. see what I'm saying? But this is the family university. This is home. And so I think that that mitigates some of that. But you know and, what? You know, you, you guys had a player transfer and take money and then go back to Alabama. We, had, we just had a player leave, take money from Ole Miss, then come back to us. I think maybe we're going to have to all learn not to have a lot of presuppositions about player movement in this era and just watch for ourselves to see what happens and why. Yeah, and and in Nebraska's defense, they have a great recent history with bringing back favored sons into the... I, I hear you. Well played. That's a great way to end it for the season finale right there. Hawkeye fan gets in one final blast. On Nebraska fan, Just and you all deserve stock it. of where they are as a program. Oh, there it still is. Still hasn't. For, haven't I know you all that. love to recycle that, and I don't blame you for that at all either. All right, that'll do it uh, for this season of Bigger Ten. We're going to take an off-season break, which will be not probably more than a month or month or maybe five or six weeks. We'll be back sometime in June, and when the magazines come out, and we're nearly to Big Ten football media days. Uh, Before you know it, the season will be here. At the time we're signing off, we're only about 115 days away from the start of the 2024 college football season. So I hope you guys have a great offseason. Don't forget to follow us uh, in between episodes, and this will be a little bit longer of a wait, at Bigger10 on Twitter or or X. At Bigger10 is where you can follow us there. For Aaron McIntyre, thoughts and prayers for Aaron, who's got to update all the imaging to the show. Uh, before you see us again. Same to all of you. Thank you for supporting us again through another year right here on Bigger 10. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. He's Aaron McIntyre. We'll see you then.